All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us. I want to first off thank Dr. Moore, Ontario's Chief Medical Officer of Health, for joining and for his incredible partnership as we work together to reopen our schools. Now, I cannot imagine the difficulty families are facing as this pandemic continues. We believe so strongly that children need to be in school, that they are essential to the mental and physical health of a child and to their academic success. We have been cautious throughout this pandemic and we've pivoted when required to ensure we protect our schools, our communities and our collective progress as we work together to get kids back to school and our lives back on track. As you know, elementary and secondary students across Ontario will return to in-person learning on January 17th with strong protections in place, fully supported by Ontario's Chief Medical Officer of Health. The Ontario Children's Health Coalition, representing SickKids and CHEO and all pediatric hospitals, have endorsed the return to class. For students, this means that they can return to a classroom where they can learn alongside their peers, led by their teachers. Now, Ontario's plan to open and protect schools is focused on deploying millions of rapid tests to our schools and our child care centres, enhancing ventilation and high-quality PP along with increasing access to vaccines for both children on a voluntary basis and staff. And as an additional measure, amid the highly transmissible Omicron variant beginning the week of January 17th, I am announcing that rapid antigen tests will be provided for schools in childcare and public schools, children in childcare settings, and students in public elementary schools. Staff and students will receive two tests each as an initial supply with over 3.9 million rapid tests shipped to schools as we speak ready for January 17th. These tests are for use when symptomatic as outlined in the updated school and child care screener that has been strengthened. We will continue to expand access to rapid antigen tests for parents, for students and staff. And these tests will be made available for students in public secondary schools on a need basis and more tests will be available in the coming weeks so that we can help limit the spread of COVID in our learning environments. This will build on the more than 11 million rapid antigen tests Ontario sent home with all children in publicly funded schools and private schools ahead of the Christmas break, the only province to do so on a proactive basis to reduce risk. We also know that vaccination remains our best defense in the fight against COVID-19. It is essential for everyone who is eligible to get vaccinated. Millions of vaccines have been administered and we know they are safe, we know they are effective. Now it is encouraging that 82% of youth aged 12 to 17 are fully immunized. Uh, that is brilliant as we continue to work to increase that rate. It is positive that nearly 50% of children five to 11 have received their first dose. However, there is more we can do and more we will do which is why our government is launching school-based clinics to support greater uptake of vaccination of eligible children and youth that requires the consent of parents in this province. This is just another option that will allow parents and children to safely and conveniently vaccinate themselves with the full consent and approval of parents. Also, we'll continue to provide planned access and accelerated access at our education childcare staff. As you know, just days ago, we announced accelerated access for these staff, encouraging them to get a booster in a community across Ontario. It'll help support stability with amongst our staff and keep students learning. We ask all education childcare staff to book early, book an appointment today for a booster in your community. Our government just in the past week stood up 10 additional uh, teacher, education worker and child care worker focused clinics that have preferential lines or standalone clinics just for them in the GTHA with pharmacies and public health units right across Ontario working around the clock to do the same. These are two new important measures that will build on our comprehensive plan to support the return to in-person learning. That is supported by high quality PP by providing access to more than 9 million non-fitted N95 masks to all education and childcare staff. We are the only province to do so in Canada out of abundance of caution with more than 4 million three-ply 
high quality mass for students that are actually uh, on the way to schools as well. Millions already are there with 4 million more on the way just to be sure every student gets access to these masks should they need it. We're also further improving ventilation by deploying an additional 3,000 HEPA units to learning environments. This builds on significant investments announced by our government over the past year and a half. Every step of the way, we have increased ventilation. And as a result of those early investments, well before Omicron hit our country and our province, we were leading in ventilation. 70,000 HEPA units in schools since September. $600 million, over 2,000 major ventilation, mechanical ventilation improvements in our schools that were underway. And together, this has really helped to ensure we have high quality ventilation in all schools because every single school has been inspected. We use the highest quality filters, MRF 13s, and we continue to take action to improve the air quality within schools. And so much so that we believe in the transparency of that information, which is why since September, Every single school in Ontario, all 4,800 without exception, have reported on their upgrades, on their improvements, on the number of HEP units in their school. That is on every school board's website and on school websites should they have a website themselves. But we're going further. We're deploying 3,000 more within our schools. We've also uh, created a more stricter screening protocol for students and staff before they enter schools to help prevent any cases from getting there in the first place. We've delivered historic funding to school boards with $1.6 million of resources to protect against COVID. It could be for mental health, for technology, for staffing, and for better ventilation. And we have supported the stability of staffing with over 2,000 projected staff that have been hired, including educators, it could be custodians, it could be mental health workers. All of these individuals are making a difference in our schools. And this is in addition to the agreement we just reached that will allow us to nearly double the number of retired educators who can work within our schools. That's gonna be critical. I wanna thank them for stepping up. 11,000 last year alone did so. And we also have expanded access to teacher candidates. Thousands of teacher candidates will continue to work within our schools and help keep uh, them open. We've also have time limited cohorting protocols to limit direct and indirect contacts of children by pausing some of those high contact sports, stricter lunch cohort protocols and elevated cleaning requirements in all of our schools. And I want to assure parents, students, teachers and staff that we are committed to providing students with a return to in-person learning with access to the support they need to ensure stability and continuity of learning. As we adapt to this pandemic, we are building on our past investments and our efforts to protect against COVID-19 by bolstering uh, rising rates of youth vaccine, significant ventilation improvements in all publicly funded schools, and high quality PPE for students and staff. And in partnership with the Chief Medical Officer of Health, we will continue to monitor current public health trends and do whatever it takes to keep your child in class and as safe as possible. These and many other health and safety measures are part of our plan for return to in-person learning, a plan that involves many partners. And I want to thank our school boards, our teachers and our staff for the significant effort and contribution towards keeping schools open and keeping the kids as safe as possible uh, up until December of 2021. And I thank them for their work on the going forward. I also want to thank families and I want to thank students for getting vaccinated and for their cooperation and leadership at home. Um, I know this has been tough, but we will get through this. And we are committed to providing our students with a learning experience that minimizes uh, potential disruption, that protects them and their friends and their families and their educators. Thank you so much. I'll now turn it over to the Chief Medical Officer of Health. Good afternoon and thank you, Minister Lecce. I'm pleased that our students will be returning to in-person learning on Monday. Returning to the classroom with their peers is crucial for our children and youth's mental health, well-being and development. I want to take a moment to recognize our parents, the students and educators for navigating the last two weeks of online learning. I know it has been challenging and stressful, yet you have demonstrated incredible resilience and adaptability, something you've all shown throughout this pandemic. 
What was asked of you was not easy, and I thank you. As we prepare for the reopening of schools on January 17th, the health and well-being of students and staff continues to be a critical priority. Throughout the pandemic, strong public health measures, along with comprehensive interventions by local public health units, have been extremely effective in supporting schools to operate as safely as possible. And as we prepare for Monday, we remain focused on the measures that we know work. While the risk of transmission in school settings can never be eliminated, it can be reduced or mitigated through public health measures, including improved vaccination, better masking, ventilation, cohorting, and staying home when sick. And we continue to invest and support these important interventions to support our kids' learning in the classroom. As the pandemic has evolved, we have had to make changes to how we manage this virus. Omicron is a very different variant than Delta. While Delta had lower transmissibility and higher virulence, Omicron is more transmissible but has lower virulence. As a result, our response to this virus has always been based on the latest science and evidence, and we have continued to be nimble in our approach. I know there has been a lot of questions on our change of, to testing and case and contact management guidance. And in the past, an entire cohort of children would have been sent home for two or three positive cases in a class, significantly disrupting classroom learning of students and impacting their households. Our new approach focuses on empowering parents and students. This includes providing take-home PCR, self-collection kits for students and staff who become symptomatic while at school, but also the rapid antigen tests are provided to students and staff as our supply is increasing and enhanced screening measures are in place. With respect to testing, the use of take-home PCR self-collection kits in schools will only be used for students and education staff who become symptomatic while at school. These kits will be provided to students and education staff who become symptomatic at school. And as the supply of rapid antigen tests increase, the government will be shifting its focus to the use of rapid antigen tests in school for symptomatic students and staff. While parents must keep their kids at home if they test positive, the five-day isolation period, if symptoms are improving for 24 hours, will ensure less disruption for both student learning and families, helping keep kids in the classroom and parents at work. I want to thank you for all your continued sacrifices, your tremendous resilience, and continued commitment to protecting one another through wave after wave of this virus. I understand that sending your children back to school on Monday will be worrying for many. The speed with which information changes and guidelines and advice are updated can be overwhelming. But please know that we continue to review the data, the evidence and adjust health and safety requirements to ensure our schools remain safe and open for in-person learning. Protecting our children and getting them back to the classroom is important for me. We must always strive to have our schools the last to close and the first to open. We owe that to our kids. Thank you, and I'll turn it back to the Minister. Great. Yes, we can go to the floor for questions. Um, I'll start if that's okay. Sure. Um, Minister, Dr. Moore just noted right here that, the, that there's, of course, and, and you know this, a lot of questions about the changes to cases and contact guidance. And, and Dr. Moore mentioned that these, these changes will empower parents. How does it empower parents to make the right decision for their kids when they're getting less information out? What we learned today is that when 30% of students and staff are absent for any reason, not even COVID related, that the school will inform the public health unit and then there's, there's a chain reaction from there. Principals don't have to tell students, teachers, parents when there's a COVID case. Absenteeism does not have to be linked to a COVID case. How are you empowering parents to make a decision when they're getting less specific information than before the Christmas break? Well, I'll turn it over to the Chief Medical Officer of Health, but I will say a differentiator in the past to the present is we now have rapid antigen tests in the hands of parents to be able to test their children twice. Uh, to ensure that uh, indeed they have or do not have COVID-19. That is going to be a layer of protection we didn't have. Of course, we awaited the federal shipment. Uh, we still need millions more that have been guaranteed. But the point is that is going to help empower parents with greater certainty to know 
uh, if they have the virus. But I'll defer to the to the chief medical officer for all to contextualize that. So, Dr. Moore, if I may, people want information to be able to make the best decision, and they're not getting that specific information anymore. What it, what is the rationale? for updating this guidance that provides parents, teachers with less information and doesn't oblige principals to provide any inf any more specific information. So as we've mentioned, we've had to pivot from uh, Delta in prior waves to Omicron. Omicron is more transmissible but less virulent as a disease and we've modified our protocols as a result. Uh, the empowerment capacity is having the tests in your home if, you're t if your child screens to have symptoms compatible with COVID-19. You have, and they're rapid antigen tests, you have an answer very quickly that empowers the parent to make the decision to keep their child home uh, and to follow the guidelines of monitoring for five days if symptoms uh, um, are, are severe, there's obviously uh, an opportunity to seek health care. So that, uh, we believe, is empowering. In, in, in the past, due to the limitations of access to PCR, we're trying to prioritize those tests for those that are the most vulnerable and maintain a reasonable turnaround time for that testing. It's essential that we have that capacity for our long-term care facilities, our hospitals, and for those that need treatment based on the PCR. So the empowerment now is that over the last two weeks, we've worked diligently to provide that uh, access to rapid antigen tests to enable parents to make informed decisions with confirmatory testing in their household, a quicker turnaround time, less demand to go to an assessment centre, less wait for PCR testing uh, and having an answer uh, at their fingertips within uh, minutes uh, actually of uh, performing the test. I do believe that's empowering. I do believe that enables parents to have uh, the decision uh, in their home to get the test done uh, and to make the decision of return to school. Uh, I can understand that school reflect community activity so uh, uh, everyone should know that the community risk is high now uh, and, and that, um, that that schools uh, will reflect what's going on in the community. Schools are not and have not been shown to be a significant multiplier of risk for communities and uh, the other measure that we put in play through the sacrifices that our Ontarians are making now from January 5th to the 21st or 26th further reduces the risk of uh, transmission because the community risk is decreasing with the no total number of social contacts decreasing. So uh, empowerment means uh, parents have the uh, test in their home, can perform it in their home uh, and can uh, make the diagnosis in their home with greater convenience, less going to assessment centres uh, uh, and um, they should be aware uh, that uh, schools aren't necessarily multipliers of infection, they reflect the community. If your community risk is high, that would be the same for any school environment. The public health measures that we've additionally put in play though in Ontario is to decrease that community risk and decrease the burden on the hospital. Uh, together with absenteeism data that will be shared um, with the public health units and communication directly to parents and families will we'll further uh, identify if the risk is going up in any community at any defined period of time. I do want to acknowledge though that the risk over the coming uh, six to eight weeks will be higher but we'll get through it. We'll have a better February uh, and then a better March uh, and um, thank parents for uh, following the guidelines, following the rules, doing the testing in the convenience of their home uh, and following the rules as they have throughout this last pandemic. Dr. Moore, I just want to shift away from pain for just a moment. Uh, I'm curious what you think of Quebec's proposed health tax uh, on the unvaccinated. Um, do you think this is a measure Ontario should be considering? And is there any public health value in a measure like that at all? Uh, we have not made that recommendation to government uh, ever uh, throughout this pandemic. Uh, it's not one that we would uh, bring forward. Um, it does, in my mind, seem punitive. Um, uh, we have always been supportive of uh, uh, adults uh, making informed decisions uh, for vaccination and have tried to increase availability and accessibility only in the highest risk setting have we mandated it. Um, and that was in the long-term care facility where all of us have realized uh, that the sacrifice of being uh, the, the, well, the increased death rate, the increased risk uh, of severe outcomes uh, had to be balanced by maximizing immunization and protection of those individuals. Um, that is as far as this government has gone in terms of mandating vaccination uh, and it dis uh, putting a penalty on those that uh, have not been vaccinated has not been entertained by this government. Can I get a follow-up 
follow up? I, I just had one more question for you, Dr. Barr. Why can you not provide the data about positive cases in classrooms, publicly reported online, and provide the rapid test? You're saying the rapid test was, was put to empower parents. We hear overwhelmingly that this is the information people want, is the continuation of that public reporting. So key metrics that we'll continue to report, uh, and we're just generating these reports now, are going to be admissions to hospital for pediatric populations, 5 to 11, 12 to 17, uh, vaccinated and unvaccinated. We're preparing those types of reports so parents can see if there's severe or adverse outcomes and the proportion of those patients that had to be hospitalized. That will be ongoing, systematically reported at a provincial level and regionally uh, for Ontario. We're just generating generating that database now, but I, I will tell you that the risk of hospitalization is very, very low in Ontario for children. So the numbers will be small and, and will be um, variable over time. Um, we will also um, be um, reporting publicly on the PCR tests that are done uh, and they would be for clinical assessment or admission to hospital and the proportion that are positive for children. So there are metrics that we want to make um, um, public to ensure that uh, everyone, uh, every parent understands that the risk from this infection, particularly the Omicron variant, is less than previous strains, that the risk to hospitalization remains low, and we've always had to have a risk-based and balance-based approach uh, to this uh, 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 pandemic, uh, and, and I think we're, we're hitting the right mark with Omicron, uh, and we will be transparent with all of those metrics. For my follow-up, uh, why are you only offering PCR testing to students and teachers that are symptomatic at school? Like, what's the scientific rationale between differentiating between someone, a kid that gets symptoms an hour after the start of classes as opposed to before? I'm, I'm so sorry. This was, uh, we had pre-distributed PCR tests across the province uh, to schools in partnership with our major pediatric hospitals. Uh, that system was working very well for uh, Delta. Uh, we, uh, those remain in the school settings and we wanted to use them as a bridge before we had our AT tests available. Given that we have uh, now got an increased delivery of RAT tests from the federal government, we are now uh, going to uh, use the, R, uh, the PCR tests that are in the school setting if symptoms develop, but also transition to increase the availability of the RAT tests. All of that having to preserve the key role of PCR testing for uh, outbreak management, long-term care, senior homes, uh, hospital-based, uh, and to our assessment centers where we're now using tests to guide treatment. And we do hope that the treatments, the oral antivirals, will be available to us in the coming weeks. Can I ask about the 30% threshold? It seems like a high number, but it also includes absences. I mean, my teen skipping school could be included in that. Why did you settle on 30% and is it actually meaningful if you're considering all these other reasons for the reasons why kids aren't there? So uh, we have plenty of experience using absenteeism data for normal viral respiratory seasons. Uh, and this is based on, on our experience uh, aggregated over the years of influenza reporting uh, in absenteeism associated with other viruses. So we do think that a thresh, given the variation in reasons for absenteeism, a threshold of a rise uh, of 30% uh, uh, most likely would represent increased activity in the community and would be a point at which we would want to acknowledge that, uh, to review what's going on in the community and communicate that back to all parents. So it seems, based on our previous experience, that that uh, number has worked well for us. Um, and what do you think is going on with the vaccine uptake with uh, 5 to 11 year olds? Why is it so low? And given it is so low and how important you say vaccines are, why have they not been mandated in schools? So it is a new vaccine, uh, and as a result of that, we um, want a greater experience with it before we'd ever mandate it. And I don't think any jurisdiction uh, in Canada ha has mandated the virus to date, or the vaccine to date, I'm sorry. Um, uh, and uh, I am, um, I always would love to see a higher uptake of the vaccine. It early days in the United States, it's showing significant protection against the rare uh, risk of hospitalization in children and use of the intensive care unit. It's almost a 20 to one ratio, just like we're seeing in adults, uh, uh, relative risk is much higher in unvaccinated children compared to vaccinated children. I, I do think we'll see that same benefit of vaccination in children as we roll out our strategy. So we're at 47, 48% at present. Uh, we want to increase accessibility, as the minister said, I have school-based clinics, uh, consent-based um, uh, with written consent from families, uh, and, and increase the availability as we can. Uh, we have done some reviews. Uh, parents are concerned 
concern that it's a new vaccine, uh, potential side effects, the risk of myocarditis, pericarditis, uh, all of those major um, uh, concerns were we've aggregated. So the Hospital for Sick Children has a call in line and they've aggregated the commonest concerns that have been identified. And now we're gonna create a question and answer uh, to be able to help uh, the conversation to alleviate any concerns that parents may have. Um, but I strongly believe in the benefits of, of the vaccination for this age group, uh, in particular, its ability to reduce severe outcomes uh, such uh, as hospitalization and use of intensive care unit. Please, sir. Um, thank you, Dr. Moore. I just, uh, just to build on that question and that concept, I mean, we've had great success with our 12 to 17s. We're at over 82%, 82 and a half percent that are double dosed, uh, one of the higher rates in Canada. And we've established that through partnerships with our pediatric hospitals, including sick kids. And we are so grateful for their work in creating that parental hotline to answer questions. We've had school focused clinics accessible at schools and community centers specifically for kids, for their parents, siblings, and the staff as well. All of that has created a safe environment and incentive to go get immunized. What we're doing now is realizing that we want to increase that rate on a voluntary basis for elementary children, 5 to 11, looking at other jurisdictions, including Newfoundland, that has adopted a more in-school during instructions, uh, during hours of instruction, that that type of uh, vaccine access could be made available. Now, yes, of course, it requires consent of parents. Uh, but the bottom line is more options for families to make it easier, reduce the barriers is the basis by why the basis for which today we have announced a plan uh, to get that program up and running. And some of those clinics will be up. Our plan is by next Friday. That's the speed by which we're moving because of the imperative of increasing vaccine rates and protecting these environments as much as possible. Um, I also will note um, that part of the announcement today is also part, is also paired with rapid tests. So that 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 on that 50 percent you know uh, constituency of kids in elementary school they're not immunized, and the fact that almost you know 98 percent of them are not double dosed yet um, to make sure they're safe. Which is why on the first day when they go back to school, our government and the premier has prioritized and literally in real time shipping. 3.9 million rapid tests available on the first day of school for kits of two tests so that parents could uh, test their children at home and increase the level of safety and assurance for themselves and for the kids and their peers in the classroom. That's going to make a difference. Uh, as well, we believe a ventilation focus in those elementary schools particularly, but all schools, where we have inspected every single school in the province. There are 4,800, three-fourths of them are elementary schools. Every one, without exception, has not only inspected their, uh, their ventilation systems, that they've improved them. We have the highest quality filters. We use MERV-13s, which the emerging science over a year ago suggested is prudent, and we've been doing that for well over a year. We've encouraged uh, the um, increasing of airflow within our schools. We run our systems two hours longer before and after to maximize fresh air intake. We've opened windows uh, and we've deployed 70,000 HEPIs. And it cannot be understated when you compare us to all provinces in the nation, at least according to publicly available information, we have more HEPA units deployed in our schools than all provinces combined. That is leadership that will help improve uh, and protect these schools. And more importantly, it'll keep the students and staff within schools in the first place, which we know is so important. Uh, I think another element I would just mention very briefly uh, is the focus on um, uh, also within elementary schools on more stricter screening at the front end and also the rules that have changed. We announced them in December, but take effect, of course, for the return to school on the 17th related to cohorting. You know, elementary uh, cohorting when it comes to lunches, more stricter uh, protocol in place where we don't have children outside of a cohort eating together. Uh, we've, we've eliminated um, uh, assemblies, school-wide assemblies. They must be virtual for a time being. We've also uh, said, look, high contact, higher risk sports, wrestling being a compelling example, will have to be uh, will have to be paused for now. All of this is very much focused on that unvaccinated constituency, but it'll help all children uh, as we seek to get them back to school and keep them as safe as possible. Okay, we'll go to the phone lines for questions now. Just a reminder, it's one question and one follow-up. First question. From Richard Southern at City News 680. Hi, good afternoon, Minister. Um, parents are wondering what's changed to make schools safe to return. And you, as you've just done, you point largely to N95 masks being sent to teachers and additional help HEPA filters being sent out. Your government, though, hasn't detailed where those have gone. 
Minister, can you guarantee this afternoon that every teacher will have an N95 mask on Monday and every classroom will have a HEPA filter? Yes or no, sir? Uh, we can absolutely commit to ensuring that the high-quality PP N95s are within schools because, Richard, they already have been shipped to Ontario publicly funded schools uh, well, by, actually by the end of last week. Uh, we've also shipping 4 million high-quality three-ply masks, which is consistent with the evidence and the recommendation of the Public Health Agency of Canada when it comes to that requirement for a high-quality mask for kids. That's also being shipped for the 17th. Millions of masks already are there. We're sending additional ones just to be safe to ensure every child, should they want one, they will get one. Likewise for staff. And that's not just educators, that's you know, school bus drivers, it's our custodians, it's the hardworking admin, secretaries, EAs, all of whom, uh, should they want, will have access to that N95. Now, with respect to HEPA units, we already had in place in September 70,000 HEPA units. We've invested $600 million ahead of the start of the school year. We uh, invested in improving the mechanical ventilation systems, 22,000 projects uh, that were underway to improve those systems. And in every school, that does not have mechanical ventilation, which is a minority, but for those that do not, to your question, we have already put in place a HEPA unit in every single classroom. What we're committing to today is shipping another 3,000 in addition to the 70,000, in addition to the $600 million of investment. And when it comes to the transparency associated with those investments, we required in September, I believe one of the only provinces, if the only province, to have said that we want parents to know themselves where these investments are going, the number of HEPA units in a school, uh, and the quality of the filtration uh, as well. And so we've required school boards in September, they all did it, all 72 school boards, to post publicly uh, that type of information, that level of granularity that I think they are entitled to. And we're going to continue to do that, update it accordingly with these new investments, new shipments on their way. Uh, and also, one, not part of your question, but I think important, is the rapid test. That we have 3.9 million rapid tests guaranteed uh, for our schools with an emphasis on, you know, uh, symptomatic kids and staff, child care as well. All of this will be in place to step up the protocol and do everything humanly possible to build confidence for you, for parents, uh, for staff, and just do everything humanly possible to protect our schools. And as I say, we will continue to be guided by the advice of the Chief Medical Officer. Felt some of the steps we've taken actually exceed public health advice out of abundance of caution. And that's what we're going to continue to do uh, in, in everything we can do uh, to support our children and keep them in school. Follow-up? Right, Minister, being in, being in classrooms are, there are two different things. But for my follow-up, we've heard from some schools that are asking, that have put out notices to parents, asking them to be emergency school monitors. Is that correct? And also, Dr. Moore, for you, on January 3rd, you said you'd look to hospitalizations and ICU numbers to determine when schools return. Both have surged to record levels. Did you misspeak on January 3rd? If you could both answer those questions, thank you. Uh, with respect to staffing, I appreciate the question, Richard. Uh, there's three parts to this. The first is the funding we put in place for the second semester, $304 million of net funding from the province of Ontario to school boards to hire staff. And up to today, we project roughly 2,350 staff have been hired within our schools. More custodians, more mental health workers, more teachers, all the above, we need them. Uh, school boards have been challenged to find staff to hire in this environment, but there's 2,300 more as we project working within our schools and supporting stable uh, environments for kids to learn. We also announced uh, an agreement just days ago with the Ontario Teacher Federation, Teachers Federation, uh, to effectively double the number of retired educators who can help work in our schools and stabilize our schools. That's 11, just last year, for example, 11,000 retirees stepped up, and I am grateful to them for doing so. And part of the reason why they did is we removed any uh, we removed any uh, penalty uh, with respect to um, uh, working in schools by expanding access to now 95 days from what originally was 50. In addition, today we're also announcing expanding access to teacher candidates. About 3,500 teacher candidates last year stepped up. Uh, second year candidates, these are educators that are on their way to becoming teachers, passionate, young, qualified, uh, and their deans of education, the f relevant faculties have sort of selected these individuals because they're ready, they've got the maturity to enter our schools on an emergency basis or as on a, on a time limited basis. We're expanding that access again from second to first years as well to ensure we have that talent pool of individuals who can work in our schools and continue to inspire our kids around the curriculum and keep them focused on learning. 
Uh, and to your question, school boards have, well before the pandemic, always had an emergency supply list of staff uh, available. Usually they were partners and community uh, family members often that can come in on a time limited basis uh, to supply. Uh, usually they'd be used and deployed for less critical elements. Uh, they often wouldn't be in an algebra class. They'd be, you know, perhaps during cafeteria, lunch supervision, things like this. But the bottom line is that has always existed. And I know school boards are working on the first three elements, the teacher candidates, the retirees, and net new teachers to be hired with the funding our province has delivered before they'd pursue that option. But uh, that option will be, uh, is prudent to have and have personnel available to step in just to make sure that these schools remain as safe as possible if we observe high rates of absenteeism within our staffing. Next question. Oh, and we'll go to the next question. From Holly McKenzie Suter at Canadian Press. Hi, there. Hi, Minister. Good to see you finally. Um, I have a question following up on something Minister Elliott said yesterday at a press conference uh, when we asked about um, any indicators that have improved public health wise since the remote learning period was announced um, because they have essentially gotten worse in hospitals since then. And she said that actually the government needed the remote learning period to get boosters to teachers and send out N95s. So as a follow up for you today, does that mean that this latest period of remote learning was only necessary to buy time because the government didn't take those protective actions sooner. We have uh, continuously demonstrated an element of caution uh, when it comes to children, when it comes to kids and staff. Uh, I appreciate the very real impact of closure on families, on kids, on their welfare and their mental health, and I, it's not lost on me how, how uh, concerning that is for so many in the province. Uh, we made a decision out of abundance of caution as Omicron raged through the country and the world to take two additional weeks. Uh, as we observed other health indicators and as we worked uh, as a collective uh, to increase immunization over that period. Now, I will say during those two weeks or week and a half uh, up to the present, we really uh, made a good use of that time. Because while we had that time, we were able to do as we intended, deploying those rapid tests. 3.9 million are on the way to schools across Ontario. We were able to stand up 10 booster clinics specifically for accelerated access to education staff. Now remember, 5 million Ontarians have already accessed a booster across Ontario. Many educators and staff have as well. Just another incentive, another encouragement to them to go get access at a clinic in their communities uh, with a speci specific line set up for them uh, to make it efficient. We also use this time to get N95s. Uh, we deployed 9 million of them specifically to schools. They already are in schools. In fact, Holly, they were there last week. Um, and so we have made use of this time with one mission, which is to continuously improve um, the protections within our schools and to do everything humanly possible using every minute of the day to uh, keep kids and get kids back to class. So over that period of time, we've set up booster clinics, we've sent uh, rapid tests, we are sending more HEPA units, 3,000, and we have um, uh, established a program for immunization for students and for staff that's going to make a difference. And the Deputy Premier, uh, the Solicitor General, the Premier, all of us, the Chief Medical Officer, we are working around the clock to do everything humanly possible to ensure the safety of children and to get them in school where I believe they belong. And I think uh, that partnership is being um, is benefiting our families in Ontario. And I think as we can increase access to the vaccine, to rapid tests, we'll build confidence and uh, we'll get our kids back to class. Follow up? Yeah, thanks. As a follow up on the rapid test, um, can you commit to a date when every staff member and student in uh, schools and daycares is going to have their two rapid tests at hand? Like, is that going to be within the next week or weeks into in-person learning? And I also just, in your opening remarks, you said something about secondary students getting the rapid test on an as-needs basis. So can you just clarify if that means high school students are not guaranteed to get two tests each? For sure. Um, look, we have, as you know, uh, and I think as uh, all Ontarians are aware, the province of Ontario has been waiting for rapid tests. I appreciate there's global supply challenges uh, and procurement challenges, but the province was promised from the federal government millions of tests that have not arrived. Uh, the consequence of that is we are working with what is available, shared through the feds to the provinces, and making that work. Now, we have 
3.9 million tests that will be in schools uh, on track for the first day to be uh, provided to all staff, to all children in elementary schools, uh, all children in childcare, and the staff within those settings. We also have provisioned um, uh, tests, rapid test kits for high school on a need basis. And so as supply comes online from the feds, we are expecting uh, over a million more tests next week will bridge that gap. So what that functionally means is uh, elementary kids will get those rapid tests at the front end. Uh, we're going to provide every high school with access to those rapid tests to use on a need basis for symptomatic purposes. And in the coming days, as the feds get us those tests that we are desperately need, we'll be able to get them into the hands of secondary students as well. Now remember, as the Chief Medical Officer of Health noted, we, have, we are the only province in Canada to have launched a province-wide take-home PCR test program, appreciating that, the, that we are pivoting to rapid tests from PCO over time, but there's capacity in the system. We, we, we sent those out on December 3rd of 2021, and they were not largely used, of course, because two weeks later, kids went home for the holidays. And so that capacity will also be used to bridge those gaps. Uh, and so we're working very aggressively. It's another uh, uh, call uh, on the feds to get us those uh, rapid tests, but most specifically when it comes to students, they will have access to it should they need it for any symptomatic child, any symptomatic student. Uh, and in fact, they benefit for the time being both from rapid tests and PCR take home tests uh, in Ontario. And we are the only province to do that. I mean, I was reflecting on what other provinces are doing when you look at the jurisdictional scans. I mean, I, you look at British Columbia, for example, I mean, they have no rapid tests set aside or dedicated for schools. I mean, their public health units have them, but none as we are doing in Ontario, giving them to you, to Ontario parents on a weekly basis. And I was reflecting on uh, in class, in school vaccine clinics will be one of the few provinces to have done that. We'll be the only province to deploy N95 masks to staff exceeding the public health advice, the science table, um, you know, and other recommendations, at least to date on PPE quality. We got ahead of that evidence out of abundance of caution. Uh, we have the largest investment in ventilation by far in Canada started not now. We're not, we're, you know, we're not reacting to Omicron. We have had these investments and protections in place since September. In fact, we started even before then, but we really stepped it up last summer. Um, and we are one of the one of three provinces, and one of the first, as I recall, to have accelerated booster access for education, childcare staff. So we're doing everything possible. We are doing our very best to demonstrate to parents that the safety of your children is paramount, and that we put in place the funding, the resources, and a protocol that is robust, that is comprehensive, and is leading in the nation in that respect. And we'll continue to do more over time to respond to risks that is always changing. Um, to make sure that we keep these schools as safe as possible. We'll go to the next question, and this will be the final question. From Caroline Alfonso at the Globe and Mail. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, we learned from a briefing earlier that public health units and then families will be notified when the absence rate in a school reaches 30%. Dr. Moore, you explained how you reached that figure, but I'm kind of curious what happens then. What are the measures that will be taken? Will that school be closed? So I, I do want to assure parents that public health agencies at a local level will be an ongoing um, contact with the boards of education, not just when uh, uh, absenteeism rate hits a certain level. Uh, there'll be ongoing communication, ongoing sharing of expertise on infection prevention and control um, uh, and consultation. So that relationship with the school boards is and will be maintained between the medical officers of health and the, and the uh, uh, directors of boards, uh, as well as between staff. Um, the the other question that you had was regarding uh, the uh, the um, thirty percent. So, given that there'll be ongoing consultations as absenteeism levels rise um, uh, at a at that given metric uh, of increase, there'll be consultation between the health unit to understand: is there an impact on the health system? Is there in, uh, what is the transition going on in that community? Uh, and a communication prepared to inform parents uh, immediately. Uh, of uh, any potential risk uh, and, and the risk assessment by the local public health agency. Does it reflect the community? Is it something unique to the schools, um, et cetera? So there'll be a, a, an explanation uh, and actions that families can take to further protect themselves, uh, adhering to all the best practices that we've put in play uh, for Ontarians. Follow up. Um, school offices right now have take home PCR tests. Dr. Moore, is it? 
am I understanding this correctly that those are not going to be replenished and your and the government is going to rely on rapid tests because I remember you saying that those rapid tests were not reliable when parent groups were trying to distribute them to kids in their community. So what has changed there and how long for a kid? Well, thank, thank you very much for the question. A lot of things have changed uh, uh, since the uh, Omicron has become the dominant. Uh, the, there is a high uh, prevalence of Omicron in the community, and hence we call it the pre-test probability of a test um, being useful to us. The pre-test probability, given the high level of community spread, makes the use of rapid antigen tests even more um, useful uh, at a local level and at a family level. Uh, and hence, uh, its use in this particular instance uh, is it can be quite um, powerful. A true positive, if it's positive, we would consider it a true positive. If it's negative, we want two negatives 24 hours of a apart to confirm that it is not Omicron. The l likelihood is much less with two negatives 24 hours apart. So our testing strategy has to have to follow the change in the virus, the change in the community risk, uh, and we absolutely do believe that uh, uh, the RATs are much more useful now than they had been uh, when we had very low prevalence in school populations uh, in, in the past. So much more useful at this time. Uh, and uh, the PCR tests um, were pre-distributed. We want to use it as a bridge to RATs. We, uh, because of the turnaround times of PCR, uh, we don't want families having to wait four, five five days for uh, a response. We want you to have the answer uh, in your home, empowered rapidly, uh, that you can interpret it to understand whether your child is at risk for COVID or not. Uh, and that uh, it, usefulness and turnaround time is best um, uh, by using the rapid antigen tests. So uh, there will be a transition. We want to use the tests that are distributed. Uh, uh, we don't think the 200,000 or so will, if uh, unless they're all used within a short time frame, uh, will be an extra burden on the on the PCR testing capacity of the province, uh, and that we can deal with the volumes. We've talked to the the uh, hospital for sick children's in Chio, and they do believe that they'll be able to process them um, uh, as best they can. Um, we we uh, I'm sorry uh, about the limitations of PCR. We really do need to keep them for the most at risk settings, uh, as I've identified, and prefer outbreak management in in high risk settings such as uh, shelters. Uh, long-term care facilities, retirement homes, and uh, uh, in the hospital sector uh, for patient treatment and management. Thanks, everyone.